Over the 50 years of the laboratory, one of the things that we've been very proud of is our support of young people in physics and um, our support of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows who've gone on to great things. Um, the Slack Theory Group, I think, has a, a really unmatched reputation for producing the bright young theorists of the field. And the next speaker is a representative of that. Uh, Jonathan Feng was a graduate student here in the early 90s. Um, this was a time when there was great development in the idea of supersymmetry, which you heard about in the last talk, as the model for physics at the next scale. The supersymmetry models had been developed 10 years before, but this was really the time when people explored what a wide range of phenomena they contained, and also the techniques for finding these models in collider data. And Jonathan, as a graduate student and as a postdoc, made tremendous contributions to that area. In the process, he got interested in supersymmetry as a model of the dark matter of the universe and very rapidly became an expert, in fact, one of the leading experts in that topic, making contributions both to the particle physics side and to the astrophysics side of the subject. So now he's a professor at University of California, Irvine. Uh, one of his accomplishments there is to actually start his own effort at hiring young people and really building one of the very strong uh, groups in the world on the particle physics and astrophysics of dark matter. And so we're very glad that he's here to talk to us about this topic. So Jonathan, thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, one thing, so I'll talk about dark matter, but uh, one thing Michael didn't mention is that he was actually my advisor. And the organizers have actually kindly encouraged the speakers to share a little bit about their connection with Slack. So I have now the distinct pleasure of telling my advisor what I really thought about my graduate school experience <laughs> in front of this distinguished crowd. And this is an opportunity I'm not going to pass up. <laughs> so let me begin with some personal reminiscences. On this happy occasion, it's a real privilege to uh, just talk briefly, at least, about my connection to Slack. I was a particle theory graduate student, as Michael mentioned, at Slack from 1990 to 95, basically right in the middle of this uh, 50 years uh, we're celebrating. I should say my uh, time at Slack started with a real bang. I can still remember this like it was yesterday. I was driving through the main gate and saw a nice celebration in my very first week at Slack in graduate school. I thought, this is amazing. Slack is this place. They've actually planned a champagne brunch for the first year uh, graduate students. <laughs> and uh, you know, what an amazing place I've come to. Of course, what I realized later is that it was not for the graduate students. It was actually the announcement of the Nobel Prize in Physics to uh, Dick Taylor and Friedman and Kendall. So that was actually the first thing that happened to me almost when I got here. Very exciting. Incidentally, one of the last things that happened in 1995 when I was just leaving Slack was another, yet another Nobel Prize to uh, Slack for in, uh, in physics to Pearl and, and Rhinus. Uh, so these, of course, were given for work that was done long, long before the prizes were uh, announced. But it sort of, I think, symbolizes some of the excitement of being here at Slack at that time. And of course, I didn't realize this then, but if I had stuck around for another three years, we would have had three more Stanford Nobel Prizes to celebrate. <clears throat> this is a uh, picture of the Slack theory group um, in those years. And I like it because. Um, we look all so young. It's really <laughs> wonderful. But also, I wanted to point out that this was not really just one group. It was really a sort of super group. There was, um, in addition to the Slack faculty and staff, there was the uh, Stanford faculty that spent a lot of its time up here at Slack. And also, uh, UC Santa Cruz was very well represented here. So it was a sort of really amazing group of collection of people. And the, the breadth of uh, research that was represented in the group at the time was really extraordinary and a fascinating place to be a student. Uh, if I were to say something that sort of characterizes Slack at that time and, and also now, uh, it fostered an atmosphere in which students were expected to learn something about everything. And uh, this is 
really extraordinary. I don't know if it's happened so much now in the era when the archive has broken the field into HEP TH, HEP PH, HEP X, Astro PH, and all its various forms. Um, I think it's fractured a bit. That didn't really happen then. And in fact, even if you didn't want to, you had to. There was no escaping this. Everyone was housed on one floor. I think uh, that was part of the vision of Sid Drell in, in thinking about the Slack theory group originally. And the students had the distinct pleasure of being in the open public area near the mailboxes and little cubicles, if you remember. Some of you remember. And so um, there was no escaping the fact that you were going to just hear conversations and be distracted. Now when I see students who are you know, in their own offices, some with windows, it's completely ridiculous. <laughs> but um, we weren't, and we benefited a great deal from that, actually. So let me just, in the last few uh, minutes of this, just, just talk about some personal highlights for me. Seminars and talks at Slack at the time were absolutely fascinating. Um, it was a well-known fact that if you gave a one-hour talk at Slack, it would take two hours, because it would be one hour of you talking and one hour of everyone else telling you what they thought of what you were saying. Uh, there was a fascinating weekly journal club run by uh, your cane, BJ, which uh, actually was very influential to me in just the sort of intellectual rigor and honesty applied to reading and writing papers. There were meetings, of course. Uh, the Slack Summer Institutes were going on at that time, and of course they go on today. Absolutely amazing. You just sat there and the world came to your doorstep. Every summer, best people in the world would come and present pedagogical talks, and then it'd be a topical conference. Fascinating uh, place to be. And there were other meetings, of course, conferences. I just want to point out my very first conference I ever went to was actually this workshop on linear colliders held in Hawaii. That was viewed as quite a scam to have your first concert conference be in Hawaii. And uh, I just still remember. One particular talk, this was a talk that Marty Breidenbach gave, uh, representing SLC and SLD, about the uh, first polarization of the electron beam. You see here it's 60% uh, or something. There's a time history of the polarization measured by the Compton polarimeter at the IP during a representative two-week period. No doubt he's using the word representative in the time-honored way to mean the best. <laughs> but uh, Despite that, this was an absolutely great achievement, and it actually led to a standing ovation at this conference, which impressed me as a young student. And I didn't really know that I'd be another 19 years before I started another standing ovation, which was basically July 4th this year. <clears throat> in addition, we had courses, one course each quarter um, covering advanced topics. It was a very uh, nice luxury. Um, and I remember courses, uh, Lance Dixon gave a course on the early universe. This was Colbin Turner, this was the year it came out. This is now a slightly obsolete and uh, classic textbook. Back then, it was hot off the presses. Wow, you could actually learn about cosmology from this book. Andre Linde talked about inflation, of course. And uh, you know, this obviously uh, plays into my interest now in dark matter. So it was a fascinating time to be here. And I would say that Slack's 50-year record of nurturing junior scientists in all sorts of fields is certainly an achievement worth celebrating today. OK, so now let's go on to the topic of dark matter. This topic sits at the interface of a number of fields, astrophysics, cosmology, and particle physics, and really is sort of an essential part of the glue that joins together uh, the cosmic and energy frontiers now. So here in this wonderful Venn diagram, the energy frontier here is in the cosmic frontier. You see dark matter sitting right at that intersection. So what I'd like to do, although it's probably quite obvious to you that dark matter belongs in the cosmic frontier. Uh, I'd like to explain a bit why there's promising evidence that it begin, belongs to the energy frontier also, why it is that an accelerator like the LHC might have a chance at actually telling us about the cosmos. It's really a rather remarkable thing. So I'll first talk about that, describe some particle dark matter properties. And then I'll talk about experimental probes. Um, what are the leading ways we think we're exploring this uh, topic now, current status. And then I will uh, engage in some completely wild speculations about what we might think of and happen in the <laughs> next 50 years. <clears throat> OK, so first, particle dark matter. So the progress that's been made since I was in grad school 20, 15 years ago is just absolutely extraordinary in this area of cosmology. We've learned a lot about the universe on the largest scales in recent years. 
And to summarize an incredible amount of breathtaking and groundbreaking work, there's now overwhelming evidence that normal atomic matter is not all the matter in the universe. So uh, this is a plot where this is measuring the amount of dark matter, and uh, this is measuring the amount of vacuum energy or dark energy. And um, you see basically that you're well off the zeros. So the current best uh, fit is dark matter is about 23% of the universe. Uh, this is to be compared with normal matter, atomic matter, which is only 4%. So we're not even made of the dominant form of matter in the universe. Dark energy is the remaining 73% uh, as a little bit of neutrinos. So this is absolutely fascinating. You know, just 15 years ago, you could have been anywhere in this plane and, and made an argument. Now we're stuck to this position with very small error bars. Unfortunately, uh, that hasn't actually translated into us knowing what dark matter actually is. Because all of this evidence here, from supernovae, CMB, clusters, et cetera, structural formation, is um, evidence of dark matter's gravitational effects. And everything has gravitational effects. Even the photon we know has gravitational effects. So to learn more, we're going to need to see it in other ways. Unfortunately, we don't really know what the other possible ways are. So um, this is a plot of various candidates for dark matter in the plane where this is the mass of the dark matter particle, and this is the interaction strength with normal matter, the uh, cross-section. And this is just a small sampling, and even here you see that this spans, well, maybe you don't see, but I'll just tell you, this spans 55 orders of magnitude down here, and uh, 63 orders of magnitude here. <laughs> okay, so we have, bottom line, we have no idea what this stuff is. Okay? <laughs> and that's a problem. If you're trying to find it in some other way, you really have no you know, handle in a model-independent way of how to grab onto this. However, that being said, some of these candidates are better motivated than others. In particular, the ones in here, I would say. And let me try to explain that. So long ago, in the 30s, uh, Fermi introduced his constant to uh, coming completely out of the particle physics, of course, out of nuclear beta decay. And we now know that we can translate that constant into a mass scale, which is about 100 GeV. And that's a new mass scale in nature. Um, as we heard in the beautiful talk of Andreas, uh, we still don't really understand the origin of this mass scale. We made, obviously, very strong progress in finding the W and the Z and, and the Higgs boson. We still don't actually understand this mass scale, but every attempt so far introduces new particles at the weak scale, whether it's supersymmetric particles, extra-dimensional particles, things like that. And so this is very special because what it's saying is if you're going to introduce a new particle to be dark matter, a very natural place would be to introduce it at this scale because there were other reasons you wanted particles at this scale anyway. Now that's sort of a qualitative uh, justification. But the amazing thing is there's a much more quantitative justification for this as well. If you take a new particle and you add it to your universe, so just, you know, obviously this is a uh, thought experiment, but put a new particle in your universe right after the Big Bang and ask how much of it is left over now. Well, clearly it depends on the particle's properties, and in particular it depends on how strongly these particles annihilate with each other. Okay, if they annihilate very strongly, there's not going to be as many of them left over now. On the other hand, if they annihilate very weakly, um, there could be a lot of them left over now. Okay? So this is a plot. I won't go into the details. This is temperature going down since the Big Bang, or you should read it as time going forward. Oh, here's time going forward here. We're talking about nanoseconds after the Big Bang. This is some measure of the amount of dark matter. And basically, the amount of dark matter drops and drops and drops, and eventually it levels out at some place when the universe becomes so dilute it stops annihilating. And it turns out that you can do this calculation numerically. Uh, you find that to a very good approximation, the amount of dark matter left over is 1 over the annihilation cross-section. And just on dimensional grounds, we can estimate that to be something like m squared over g to the fourth, where m is the mass of this new particle, g is the sort of coupling constant present at these vertices. Okay, so there's 
two dark matter particles annihilating it to say two quarks. And the thing is, if you put in this 100 GeV scale motivated by Fermi, and put in a sort of order one coupling constant, what you'll find is the amount of dark matter left over is about 10%, plus or minus factors of maybe 10. But nevertheless, it's not wildly off. I mean, look at the scale here. We're dropping orders of magnitude here. And if we get off according to sort of the weak scale, we end up with the right amount of dark matter. And so this is saying there's not just a qualitative motivation, there's a quantitative motivation here, which is telling you that both particle physics and cosmology point to the 100 GeV scale for new particles. Okay, and that's why dark matter is actually a topic at the energy frontier also. We are now getting to probe the scale, which is the natural scale where you might expect new particles to be dark matter. Okay, so that's the motivation for why this sits beautifully at both the cosmic and energy frontiers. Now, of course, this is all pure theoretical speculation here. We obviously need to investigate this experimentally. The nice thing about this whole story is not only does it motivate a particle, it tells you how to look for it. If you want to have that correct relic density, you need these particles to annihilate with a certain strength. All right? Otherwise, you'll have way too much or way too little. And um, that tells you that uh, so there should have been some efficient process, this sort of four-particle process, where two of these dark matter particles annihilate and end up in quarks, for example. Okay? But we expect physics to be not that different a nanosecond after the Big Bang than it is now. And so if it was happening back then, it should be happening now. So we should also have efficient annihilation now. Two dark matter particles floating around in the galaxy somewhere should be able to also annihilate and make two things we could actually see. And this is called uh, the strategy of indirect detection, to look for the annihilation products of dark matter. <clears throat> you can also, if you have this four-point interaction, run the time the other way, in this direction. And what this is telling you is that dark matter ought to scatter off of normal matter elastically. Okay, so a dark matter particle comes in, dark matter particle comes out, but in doing so, it bumps off of something, and so it leaves a little bit of a, a trace. And so this is the strategy of direct detection. And then last, but certainly not least, is you can run time up. And so it ought to be possible to start with two quarks, say in protons, say at the LHC, smash them together, and out come two dark matter particles. And so you ought to be able to study dark matter by looking at particle colliders. And, and the fact that you get the right relic density tells you there's sort of a bottom to this story. You can't have this process be completely inefficient or else the whole story breaks down. And so there's sort of, although not strictly speaking, but there's sort of a um, minimal interaction strength, a minimal number of every direction here, minimal number of dark matter particles that should be produced at the IC, a minimal amount of scattering that should happen in direct detection, a minimal amount of uh, annihilation products. And that's, of course, very helpful to an experimentalist. We don't want this bottomless pit to just go down and uh, keep going. Okay, so what I'll do now is just describe some of these um, uh, strategies and give the current status. Direct detection first. So this is scattering and leaving an imprint and some energy in a detector. So just for those of you who don't think about dark matter at all or much, um, we're talking about a particle that's 100 GeV the local density we know to be roughly one per liter, if it's at that mass. Okay, so in every sort of coffee cup, there's one of these. They're whizzing around at 10 to the minus three the speed of light. And current bounds, if you want to get into this dark matter game, are uh, one, less than one interaction per kilogram per year. So we already know that it doesn't interact very much, and this is sort of the level. We can therefore look for normal matter uh, recoiling from wind collisions in ultra-sensitive detectors placed deep underground. So this is a very simple cartoon. You have a sensitive dark matter detector down here. You put it way underground so that it get rid of all these cosmic rays and backgrounds, and you wait for one dark matter particle to come in here, bump off of it, and leave a recoil energy. This has been an area of rapid progress and really great interest on two fronts. So let me try to describe those two right now. The first is the uh, weak interaction frontier. So uh, I'm you know, going to gloss over many details, some of which are actually important. But uh, the canonical thing people do is they take an experimental result, convert it in some way with some theoretical uh, prejudice, 
to a dark matter proton cross-section, and then plot bounds, or in the case of a discovery, some favored contours. So this is a plot of sort of the snapshot of the field right now. Here is the WIMP mass, the, the putative dark matter mass. Here's 100 GeV, so that's kind of the scale we're looking at. And this is the interaction cross-section off of a proton. And you see just a whole bunch of experimental results. And, and I'm sorry this is such a mess, but this field is so active, you, you know, I think this has already been scrubbed of all results older than three years old, and it's still got all these things on it. The, the current, oh, okay, so all these contours here are um, excluding everything above them, okay? And so, uh, for example, CDMS, in which uh, Slack has played a very important role, has a bound that's somewhere around here, and you can't be, be of, above that. Uh, xenon has recently pushed this down even further. You can't be above this sort of colored band. Okay? And so by weak interaction frontier, what I mean is the frontier of going down farther and farther to lower cross sections. And, and it's just incredible. I mean, just two years ago, we were sort of up here. Now we're here in order of magnitude, and there are, of course, plans to go farther. This is an extremely interesting frontier because of the rapid progress. Anytime you keep making orders of magnitude improvement, that's great. And the second reason is that way in the back here, although you can't hardly see it, is, uh, some, are some shaded regions. And these are actually predictions of pretty reasonable models, supersymmetric models that pass all other constraints. And so not only are we getting fast progress down, we're actually now finally covering model parameter space that's actually very nice from many, many perspectives. And so, right as we speak, dark matter experiments are killing off models um, left and right. It's, it's <laughs> frightening, actually. So here's a picture of CDMS uh, in the Sudan mine, uh, you know, very deep underground. <clears throat> I mentioned there were actually two frontiers. One is down here. The other is sort of on this side, looking at low masses. Okay, so it's low threshold, low mass frontier. And this is exciting because uh, actually in that area, some experiments have already claimed a signal. So the signal that's probably most well known is from DAMA. It's an experiment uh, that is looking for annual modulation. And the idea behind this is very simple. The Earth is going around the sun some parts of the year the Earth's velocity is adding constructively with the suns. Sometimes it's adding destructively. And therefore, you expect a modulation with a period of a year in any sort of rate if you're actually bumping into dark matter. And so um, this is their data um, from, wow, I don't know, 13, 15, 16 years, something like that. And here's the fit, the modulation. And uh, without imposing that it be a year period, you get that as an output of the fit, the maximum is June 2nd, which is about right too. And uh, you know, they see this modulation, and they've been seeing it for over a decade now. Uh, that signal has now been supplemented by other results, which are um, more or less uh, um, statistically significant, but Cogent and Crest have also uh, claimed that there's some background that they don't understand, at least. And so actually, if you see on here, they're not only bounds, but there are some closed contours, which are actually signals. So these are the regions that should be the dark matter parameters because they've actually seen a signal. And it's a very, very confusing situation right now. One of the first things you'll notice is that the regions here are actually excluded by the bounds here. All right, so uh, it's not gonna be so simple to make everything work out together. But this has led to a great amount of interest down here. And so this is something that's uh, very actively discussed now and I think a very exciting area. Okay, now let me move to indirect detection, completely different. This, I always like to describe it as a dark matter mad libs. Dark matter annihilates in a place to particles which are detected by an experiment. And you can fill this in any way you want and send the proposal to the DOE for 10 million bucks and you will have a dark <laughs> matter experiment. So uh, there's, seriously, there are many, many ways to think about this. There are, particles can be, uh, you know, anti-deuterons, positrons, photons, neutrinos, you name it. Um, so I'll just give a very small sample um, of these. So one is positrons. So um, a very interesting way to fill in the blanks is dark matter annihilates in the galactic halo to positrons. 
which are detected by some experiment, uh, space-born or balloon-born typically, so Pamela, Attic, and of course Fermi, with his strong leadership here at uh, SLAC, are possible ways to actually uh, see positrons. This is actually really interesting because this is actually a photon, designed as a photon detector, but they, they, through some really clever techniques, can also look for positrons. And so, um, just to give some sort of current update here, a uh, big splash was made four years ago by Pamela, which, uh, so what is this? This is the energy of the particle, the positron, or electron. This is the positron fraction. So. And we get positrons and electrons, of course, just astrophysically, but this fraction is supposed to be well predicted. And this is this line here. Again, another slack product with uh, Igor Moskalenko and Andrew Strong predicting the background here. And uh, Pamela actually saw this, which clearly does not agree with the prediction of astrophysical background. Uh, right around that time, Attic saw also an excess above that background. Um, since that time, Fermi has come in and, and seemingly um, smoothed out that, that excess, so that's not probably there anymore. Uh, but they've also confirmed the Pamela results. So this is Fermi results from just last year, confirming this rise in the positron fraction. So this is very interesting. Is that extra dark matter? Well, initially, um, people got quite excited. I certainly got quite excited. Um, it's hanging around in the sort of 100 GeV area, which is where we expect WIMPs to, to be. It has a shape that actually can be very well fitted to dark matter annihilation. Unfortunately, the flux is a factor of about 100 or 1,000 too big for a thermal relic. I mentioned that the whole WIMP paradigm predicts a rate for annihilation, for annihilation strength. And this had to be artificially jacked up by about a factor of 100 to agree with um, the, the observations. So this motivated an enormous amount of work, um, but it also motivated a realization that pulsars could probably be explaining this. So um, not your sort of run-of-the-mill astrophysics background, but astrophysical background nonetheless. And so Fermi, for example, put out a paper where it showed that some reasonable pulsar models seem to go through the data. And so I think at this point, pulsars are a far more likely explanation than dark matter, but it shows you a sort of a flavor of what can be done in indirect detection. Uh, photons themselves are also extremely interesting indirect detection messengers. You can have dark matter annihilating in the galactic center or in dwarf galaxies through photons, which are detected by, again, Fermi, or Hess or Veritas, some of these uh, so-called atmospheric Cherenkov telescopes here. I, uh, let me not go into this too much, other than to say that this is an extremely interesting um, line of research um, because, in fact, already some of the Fermi results are cutting into the parameter space of WIMPs. WIMPs predict a certain annihilation cross-section so that they will have the right relic density, this band here, and you see that the Fermi results are already eliminating some of this for certain models uh, and certain masses. But it shows you that it's getting to a very interesting level. And Rene Ong will talk about uh, this much more in detail, so I'll skip most of this. And then finally, neutrinos. Um, this is also very interesting. Dark matter can annihilate in the center of the sun to neutrinos, which are detected by, for example, ice cubes. So dark matter is swing swinging around. Sometimes it hits something in the sun, slows down, sinks into the core of the sun, then you get a nice, dense population of dark matter particles, they annihilate more than usual, out comes a neutrino, and this could be seen when it converts to a muon in, uh, in the Antarctic. So this is also a fascinating technique. Okay, so then last, let me go to particle colliders. <laughs> this, of course, is taken on a whole new uh, dimension now that the LHC has been running. Um, at seven or eight TV, and, and in a couple of years, even higher. What does the LHC actually see? Well, it's a little complicated because dark matter doesn't actually leave a signal. So what it leaves is a no signal, right? What it leaves is an absence of something, and you have to look for that absence. 
So it's very much like a neutrino, but these particles are actually, I mean, some of these particles make neutrinos look like, you know, 800 pound gorillas. So this is really not going to interact in your detector. So as an example, uh, in a supersymmetric realization of the WIMPs, uh, you could have gluino pair production. So here's some gluons that are in the protons. You collide at the LHC. They make a gluon, and that gluon makes two gluinos. And then each of those gluinos decays. And often it's through a very complicated multi-step process. But in the end, what you end up with is this chi here, which is the dark matter. Okay? And then that just disappears from your detector. So you actually don't see the particle. What you do see is missing momentum. And so you could have a case where, for example, the collision happens here in this uh, atlas detector. Out come two neutralinos or, or dark matter particles. And they all come out you know, in that direction. That's very weird, because that means that there's an imbalance of momentum. And so that's telling you something is missing. Of course, something is missing when you have neutrinos, too. So you have to make sure it's not just some standard, uh, standard model uh, possibility. But anyway, this has been uh, you know, an active, active research for um, the ATLAS and CMS experiments. Here's just some of the recent results. Uh, which are in a specific model called minimal supergravity, ruling out large swaths of parameter space. Okay? And every new conference, this boundary keeps moving up. Um, but right now, it has not covered, uh, in any sense, all of the parameter space, and not even all the parameter space where you have good dark matter. So it's, it's a very interesting thing to keep track of. Um, but so far, there's no sign of any uh, dark matter production. Okay, so about how much time is there? Almost time. <laughs> okay, well, let me uh, quickly, can, well, let me talk about future prospects. So here's the question, and this comes up often when we talk about things like limited funding. Are we most likely to discover dark matter through direct detection, indirect detection, or at particle colliders? So let's figure out which one of these is the right way to do it and direct resources in that direction. And I can tell you what the answer is. The answer is yes. <laughs> we need all three of these. And actually, we also need astrophysical probes and body simulations, things like that. I, I've given very short shrift to. I'm sorry about that. But let me tell you why. And there are many, many answers to this question. At one level, you can just do a thought experiment. We have several signals already, and yet nobody has decided we've actually seen dark matter. Okay? So, Clearly, it's not going to be just simply you do it one way, and you find it, and then you're done. Another way to say is we need cross-checks. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Right? We're going to claim that we've now discovered what 23% of the universe is made out of, and that clearly requires extraordinary evidence. Actually, this answer goes much deeper than that, and there's this whole topic of dark matter complementarity, which, which is uh, uh, becoming rising in our field. Direct and indirect detection even if these future experiments, you might just say, well, look, the experiments we have right now that have these signals, they're not done very well. So, you know, let's do it a little bit better and then we'll have a nice signal. Even if you have a strong signal, you'll be unable to determine the details and properties of dark matter. Um, is it SUSY? Is it extra dimensions? Take one of the signals and just decide it is dark matter. Ask, what do you learn? And you will never be able to get information like this. Particle colliders, it's even worse, actually. Even if you see some missing energy, you can't tell if that particle that left your detector lived 100 nanoseconds or 10 giga years. Right? So you have to extrapolate for 24 orders of magnitude before you can say that's dark matter. So clearly, we need a multi-pronged approach. Um, and if I were to guess what's going to come, uh, I think, in the next 50 years, well, first, obviously, we need to discover it. We need to see signals by more than one method. And then that'll lead to a second stage we will enter an initial era of uh, precision dark matter studies. Um, this will do two things, I think. First, it will strengthen the case for dark matter discovery. So I won't talk about it, but people have done studies showing that if you actually had a one-ton dark matter detector and you saw hundreds of events, you could measure the mass of the dark matter particle, similarly with colliders, similarly with indirect detection. If all these measurements say that this particle we're seeing is you know, 382 GeV plus or minus 10 GeV, we're pretty sure we're seeing the same thing. So that would strengthen the case that we really did discover dark matter. And of course, it provides initial information about the particle properties. And then 
eventually, if you give me 50 years, I can go nuts and postulate that we will enter an era of dark matter astronomy. So let me just mention what I mean by that. Um, here's an example. So let's say you see an example, a signal at colliders and in direct detection. Okay, this nice study of uh, Baltz, Battaglia, Peskin, and Wazanski showed that at the LHC, or even better, at the LHC with the ILC, you could actually predict the cross-section of that dark matter scattering off of normal matter to, you know, factors of a few. Similarly, the, the uh, direct detection, clearly they're sensitive to that, that's their signal. And if you have a lot of data, uh, and green is shown, you can constrain the dark matter mass, dark matter cross-section plane to very, very small uh, contours. And probably should be fuzzed out a bit by astrophysical uncertainties. But anyway, you can make some nice uh, conclusions. And what you can then do, if you know the rate, and you know the cross-section, you can determine the flux. In other words, you can figure out what really is the local dark matter density right around us, and how fast is it moving. Okay? So that's what I mean by sort of dark matter astronomy. Indirect detection uh, can be even more amazing. If you see signals at, say, CTA, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, this big proposed project, you will then have some flux for photons. And uh, the flux for photons is beautiful in that it factorizes. There's an astrophysical piece, which just depends on how much clumping the dark matter does. And then there's a particle physics piece, which depends on all the particle properties. But if you, say, have colliders telling you all about the particle physics, and you have CTA telling you all about the flux, you can solve for this, the astrophysics. And you can therefore determine the particle, uh, or you can determine the astrophysical distributions on galactic scales. We can answer, or at least provide some information about is dark matter uh, cuspy or cord in the center of the galaxy, and things like that. And last, let me just say, a concluding thing, this is my holy grail, things that I would really like to be able to do, is to determine how dark matter was produced on cosmological scales. So well, how this would work is, you remember this plot, where you get off this curve and how much dark matter is left is completely determined by the particle physics properties of your dark matter. If you could actually measure those properties at a collider very, very precisely, you could reconstruct this curve, reconstruct the dark matter freeze out in the early universe. How well can we do that? Well, this has been studied. Um, right now, current constraint on dark matter is a fractionally about, I don't know, eight, six percent. So WMAP tells us a lot about the relic density, but very little about it, the mass of the dark matter. The LHC, in the best case scenario, could actually tell us the mass if we actually saw supersymmetry, could tell us about the annihilation. Uh, beautifully, and uh, we hope in a few months, Planck will sharpen this in the cosmological side, and I would hope that if we actually have all this going on, there would be sufficient motivation to actually build a future collider like the ILC, which would just do amazing things, would measure the dark matter mass to 50 MeV, and measure the relic density to a uh, percent level. So the idea is that we could actually compare you know, microscopic with macroscopic data and actually see if they match up. So the idea then would be um, look at the prediction from high energy physics, the observations from cosmology, are they matching up? If they do, then probably that is actually how dark matter is produced. That freeze out curve is not just a figment of the imagination, that's actually what happened a nanosecond after the Big Bang. So congratulations, you discovered the identity of all the dark matter, extended our understanding of the universe to 10 GeV temperature times a one nanosecond after the Big Bang. Of course, it might not be this easy. And if it doesn't work out like that, then there's a whole flow chart you have to go through to sort things out. But you know, if you'll give smart people 50 years, I'm sure they can do that. So let me conclude. Dark matter is central to both cosmology and particle physics. We're reaching a really interesting time now, where a lot of the theories that have been on the market for decades are getting excluded now. The LHC is running, direct detection is improving by leaps and bounds, indirect detection, astrophysical probes are improving rapidly also. The field is really being transformed now, I mean, as we speak. In the next 50 years, who knows what will happen, 
but Slack will undoubtedly continue to play a central role in the exciting era ahead, and I can't wait to see what happens. Thank you. So thank you very much. I guess Persis gets the private place for the question. <laughs> thank you for a beautiful talk. Um, the normal matter sector, that 4%, is quite complex. There are six quarks, six leptons, four mm -hmm. forces. How does the potential complexity of the dark matter sector, because there's no reason to think it would be any simpler than right. the normal matter sector, play into some of the conclusions that you have drawn? In other words, it just might not be so easy. Yes, uh, well, I completely agree. So many of the studies, and probably all the ones I've shown, have just assumed one component. And of course, that's a natural thing to do, you know, your first step. But, but you're right, if, you know, there could very well be, you know, some of it is uh, neutralinos and some of it is axions. I mean, that, that would be, you know, more complicated, and yet we can still conceive of that. Who knows what we can't conceive of? Um, a lot of the bounds that we're talking about, you know, they scale just by what percentage of that dark matter you're probing is actually contributing to dark matter, right? So um, it, it's very complicated. There are now um, more and more people working on sort of hidden sectors that are a little more complicated, which have their own dynamics and their own freeze out and their own temperature and things like that. And we're learning quite a bit about how um, model dependent a lot of these results are. So I, I don't have a, a nice positive answer. It's just more complicated. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, one more. Yeah, since there are no other questions, I might as well ask mine. Um, <laughs> Uh, Persis Pers already said that it could be quite complicated in that sector, and um, I was thinking about um, uh, it could also have a CP violation, and in that case, there might not be any anti-dark uh, matter particles in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you've talked a lot about um, uh, annihilation of, uh, of dark matter particles, and that would lead to observable things by uh, things such as uh, you know, the Fermi telescope. But uh, if, that, uh, if that is the case, if you have a big CP violation and you don't have any anti-dark matter particles, uh, what would you do then? Yeah. Well, so that, that's a, certainly a possibility. And that would basically eliminate all prospects for detection that indirect detection, right? Direct detection, however, is still a possibility in those cases. So you know, that would be um, the place to go. And I, I should say you know, this has been explored much more recently with the excitement about these low mass dark matter particles because it hasn't escaped attention that um, if you had a 5 GeV dark matter particle, then given the relic densities of dark matter and baryons, they could have the same number density and perhaps those are related. So we expect that in the visible sector, the baryons we see, the normal model we see is sort of left over from CP violation and maybe there's some connection there with this uh, dark matter also leaving an asymmetry. So th this is actually quite an interesting uh, field. It's just, I think, sort of had a renaissance in the last few years because of these uh, low mass dark matter uh, indications. OK, well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you. Yeah.